hello YouTube. Today in the Naughty Librarian, I am doing my full review and recap of Lasher by Anne Rice. This is book two of the Mayfair Witches trilogy, and due to popular demand, or we can call it peer pressure, <laughs> everyone really wanted me to read this one. And I, originally I was not going to, but um, I have capitulated to popular demand and I read it. And who boy, this whole book is basically an exercise in someone saying, wow, book one was wild. And Anne Rice going, oh, you thought that was wild? Hold my beer. That all being said, quick little disclaimer here before we go forward. Um, I would best categorize the genre for this book as sexual terror, <laughs> frankly. So just be aware, trigger warnings for all of the sex-based triggers you can think of. They're all in here. Yikes. There's a lot of sexual terror. Just be aware, it's gonna get rough. On that note, let's get into this one. Starting things off. This is a from the bottle kind of book already. <laughs> Starting things off, okay? We get introduced to a new character, Mona Mayfair. Now, Mona is 13 years old. 13. She is a child. But she is also, I don't know, rather mature for her age, considering uh, both of her parents are drunks, and she's also the byproduct of all of the Mayfair inbreeding. I, I think she's related to Julian in at least three different ways. But there's a lot of inbreeding going on here. She is a powerful witch in her own right, even though she is 13. And the biggest red flag about Mona is that she had been experimenting with sex since she was about eight years old. Of her own volition, at least, so there's that, but still, yikes. She is a middle schooler. Like, middle schoolers still have rolly backpacks. They should not be sexualized in this manner. <laughs> it's, it's a lot to deal with right off the bat. Mona is going over to the Mayfair house for two reasons. One, she's going to go look for Julian's old like gramophone. Uh, in her dreams, Julian's been appearing to her and telling her to go find the gramophone. Mona is a bit of a medium, I would say, and she's a little prescient about the future and like she can control minds. She has a lot of powers going on here. And the second reason she's going over to the Mayfair house is because she wants to seduce Michael. You know, Rowan's husband, who's nearly 50 years old, Michael. <laughs> Oh my god. She tries to seduce Michael round one, and Michael has been on a lot of sedatives since Rowan left and he had his heart attack, and he's still like out of it, but like he has enough sense left to say, uh, no, you're 13. Uh, <laughs> it's dark and it's late and your parents are drunk, so you could like stay, but you're gonna stay in a different room. So Mona, she goes downstairs, she's gonna start getting ready for bed, but then she starts hearing La Traviata play. And it's the, the record that Julie would always play on his gramophone. So something's happening in the house. There's like a spell being cast. And she follows the music into the library and she sees Michael in there and he's sitting there and he's also kind of bewitched by the music playing. And also all of the sedatives in his system, he's a little out of it. And well, Mona gives the whole seduce Michael uh, a second go around and um, it's successful. Like, they have all of the sex and she is 13 years old and Michael has had sex with a 13 year old and he is nearly 50 and I am grossed out. This is like chapter two. <laughs> this is chapter two of the book. <sighs> Meanwhile, Rowan is still missing since the end of book one. She has gone off with Lasher and the only contact anyone has had with her is one of her old colleagues, Larkin. Um, she sent over like samples of like amniotic fluid and blood and, and breast milk and tissue samples, etc. She sent over a bunch of genetic materials and she, she sent it to him because she trusted him to get it to this other doctor, a geneticist named Mitchell Flanagan. So after these two like scientist doctors do all these tests on the materials that Rowan was able to send to them, they find out a lot of things. Essentially what happened here is that through all of the selective genetic breeding that happened within the Mayfairs, 
Rowan had 46 additional chromosomes that were just dormant in her body until she became pregnant. Mind you, humans only have 46 chromosomes. She has twice as many. She has 92 chromosomes. What is she doing with them all? Rowan's been sending all these samples because apparently Lasher has managed to impregnate her and she wants to figure out what is growing in her womb because obviously this is not a human. This is a another species. What is it? But speaking of Lasher impregnating people, <laughs> the next time we see him, he's on the hunt for other Mayfair women that might be genetically compatible enough for him to successfully breed with. First stop is Destin, Florida, and he goes to the vacation house of Gifford Mayfair. And Gifford, she's one of the good ones. Like she tries very hard to not be like the gross type of Mayfair. You like her. And through all of the inbreeding, she's like a tenfold Mayfair, like yikes at this point. So she might have enough genetic mutations to be able to breed with Lasher. So you kind of see where this is going here. Um, Lasher kind of puts her in a trance and assaults her. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's graphic and on page. It's not like vague or off page. It's this graphic assault. And, and she gets pregnant immediately and then also miscarries immediately and hemorrhages to death body horror and sexual terror everybody so once the family finds out gifford is dead the the mayfair legal team starts getting their asses in gear and the legal team involves a uh, ryan and pierce which is gifford's husband and son respectively so you know they have a lot riding on this investigation someone murdered their wife and mother they want to find out what exactly happened to gifford they want to find out what happened to rowan where is she she's disappeared so they find out that another Mayfair woman had died the day after Gifford in the exact same way. So they know Lasher's on the move going through Mayfair women. So they know that. And they, as for Rowan, they found out that she was in with Lasher in Europe, but she, while she was in Europe, people who saw her like firsthand accounts said she looked really sickly and injured. And she seemed to be having been kept prisoner by Lasher. And in this investigation, we also find out that things are brewing with the Talamasca, where they're trying to like lock down all of the Mayfair files and keep everybody out of them, including Aaron, who's like the lead on this case. And they say it's because he's too close. And I mean, he is. He is dating B Mayfair. So, you know, he, he's definitely very close to the family, but you know what, Aaron's 80, let him get some, you know? Like, why are you being a dick about it, Talamasca? And Aaron has a protege named Yuri, and even he thinks something is rotten in the state of Denmark with the Talamasca. So he goes against orders, and he flies to America to go meet up with Aaron because he's like something, they're not telling us all of this, what's going on, they're blocking us out of the investigation. And then it turns into like a slight spy thriller for a minute because Yuri gets to America and he starts getting strange messages from people he doesn't know in the Talamasca. He's being followed. Like usually Yuri is the investigator they send in to follow people and the people they're sending in are not as good as him. So he knows he's being followed. And meanwhile, all of that is going on. There's a lot of emphasis with Julian in this book. He's been visiting several uh, Mayfairs in their dreams as like a ghost spirit thing. He's been visiting Mona and he's in particular been visiting Aunt Evelyn. Aunt Evelyn is very elderly. She's probably 90 years old at least and she had a child with Julian when she was also 13 years old. There's a lot of sexualized 13 year olds in this book yikes so she's very devoted to julian and julian comes to her in dreams and he tells her you need to go find my old gramophone i need it so she makes her way over to the mayfair house and she and michael and mona they find julian's gramophone finally they've been telling everybody he needs um Basically, Evelyn had stored it in the wall of the library of the Mayfair house to hide it from Carlotta so Carlotta wouldn't destroy it. So Evelyn has achieved her goal. She's helped Julian. She ends up leaving. Mona stays behind. And um, Seduce Michael Part 3 begins. And they just have way more sex. Way more sex. And Michael doesn't even have the excuse of being under a spell and also sedatives. He's fully in his right mind. He's not bewitched. There's no drugs in his system. He just fucks a 13 year old. 
Dear Lord, why? So after all that, Mona finally goes home and Michael goes upstairs and it, it sounds like someone's breaking in. So he's looking all around trying to figure out what's going on and he goes and he gets to Julian's old bedroom and boom, guess who's there? Ghost Julian. He got summoned by his old gramophone and he has to tell Michael his story because it's imperative to stopping Lasher. Okay, so we're gonna have a flashback to Julian's story right now. We get all of Julian's backstory. So Julian was always a witch, even when he was a tiny little boy and Lasher was kind of naturally drawn to him because he was like a clever little kid and would say things and he had power. And, oh, here's the gross stuff. Like there's certain mentions in the book of Lasher making Julian feel physically really good but mind you, he's kind of telling it as if a child was saying these things. So it's highly suggested that Lasher was diddling this kid. For fuck's sake, like who hurt you, Anne Rice? What are you doing? <laughs> There's so many sexualized children in this book. But moving on from that, he learns from his grandmother, Marie Claudette, that loud music in particular confuses and distracts Lasher. So you can talk to someone without Lasher knowing what's going on is the only way to like keep him away or distracted. Loud music. This is like a good tool to have in your arsenal. And as Julian grows up, he becomes smarter and smarter and clever. And he eventually kind of figures out Lasher's true intentions toward the family. You know, Lasher's giving the family everything they desire so he can manipulate them into inbreeding with each other and producing a witch strong enough to give him a body. Like Julian figured this out way back in the day. And since Julian figured this out, the only logical place for it to go after, you know, Lasher achieves his goal is that he'll start to destroy the family because he no longer needs them. Because even though, you know, Lasher loves his witches, he also very much hates them at the same time. They're like a symbol of his imprisonment. So Julian's like, yikes, like this is a problem. And the fact that Julian was clever enough to figure this all out and also point out like blatant lies that Lasher tells all the time, it just pisses the hell out of Lasher. And you don't want to piss off like a demon ghost. So Julian, he just keeps backing off. Every time Lasher gets into a tizzy, he keeps letting Lasher win, even though he's figured this shit out, but he has no recourse. And Julian also tells Michael about his sister, Catherine, who was the actual inheritor of their generation. And she's the one who married the architect who designed the Mayfair house. And when uh, Darcy died, she was inconsolable. So, like she was losing her shit. And so she called for Julian to come to the house and help her because she really hadn't seen him in years. They had a whole falling out after she went off with Darcy. Now up until this point, it was suggested that they had a consensual relationship with each other that produced a child. We find out that was not the case because Julian in fact assaulted his sister and her mind really never recovered afterward. So yes, he, he has sexually assaulted his sister. Julian is disgusted with himself, as he should be, but also realizes now that he's done what Lasher wanted him to do, there's nothing really keeping Lasher from causing an accident that would kill him. So he's like, oh shit, I've gotta come up with something that'll make Lasher wanna keep me alive. <laughs> so he decides to let Lasher possess his body. Hey, take my body out for a spin, you get to pretend like you're human for a bit. But a side effect of Lasher taking control of Julian's body is that Julian's mind kind of merges with Lasher and he finds out a lot more about Lasher's true nature. And Lasher has some very deeply repressed memories of being human and, and a Catholic way back in the day in Donley, Scotland. So Julian decides to keep letting Lasher possess him over and over again so he can keep learning more and more about Lasher's past. And then eventually Mary Beth, the daughter he had with his sister Catherine, grows up and she and Julian, they make their way to Scotland. And, you know, Mary Beth is going there for vacation but Julian is going to Scotland particularly because he wants to dig deeper into what he has already learned about Lasher's past. And Julian meets up with a scholar, right? And he tells him that like in the 1500s, there used to be a big like Catholic cathedral in Donleith and it was burned down like violently in the Protestant Reformation that was happening in this time period. Also, the people of Donleith were said to have worshiped like an unofficial Catholic saint Saint Ashler of Scotland. Ashler, Lasher, like get it? We're on to something here, right? <laughs> and on top 
of all of that hearsay, there was also more hearsay that there was a, like a race of people who lived there that weren't really human and they were feared. So things are starting to fall into place a bit. And Julian's like, this is good work, scholar. Like, I'm going to give you a lot of money. Keep doing what you're doing. So he starts like this whole endowment to keep digging into Donnelly to find out more clues. And as for Mary Beth, we find out that she did in fact actually just bang a random Scottish dude and get pregnant with Belle. Like, I always thought it was Julian. I swore it was Julian. It's, it was highly suggested that it was Julian, but thank goodness it wasn't. Small favors. She just banged a random Scotsman. So Mary Beth, she gives birth to Belle and she and Julian go back home to Louisiana. And as soon as they're back, like Lasher starts in on Julian. He's pressuring him. He's like, yay, hey, go make a baby with Mary Beth. Oh, I need a new witch in line. Go, go make babies with her. And Julian doesn't want this. He's like, no, thanks. Uh, I did this once. I don't want to do it again. However, Mary Beth, totally fine with the idea of it. Like she loves Lasher and she will help him however she can. She's totally fine with banging her both father and uncle. Like, dear Lord, stop it. In an effort to push this off as long as possible, he convinces Mary Beth that she should marry Daniel McIntyre, who was one of Julian's like ex-lovers. He's like, please take him, go, go marry that, go over there. And she does, and she has two children with Daniel. She has Carlotta and Lionel. Neither of them are suitable inheritors though, so they're still looking for that next Mayfair witch. And eventually Lasher pressures Julia enough that he gives in and he fathers a child with Mary Beth, creating Stella. And before in like the witching hour when we had incomplete historical records, it was suggested that it was actually Cortland who was the father, but it wasn't, it was Julian. Damn, this is gross. And at this point, Julian is getting older. He, he's, he's elderly at this point. And Mary Beth starts going on a crusade to erase all of the knowledge Julian gained about Lasher. So she like burns all of Julian's research and his journals and all of the information he gathered about just the family tree. And she basically does this because she wants to strengthen the family's attachment to Lasher and encourage more inbreeding in the family to help Lasher Damn, Mary Beth, you a bitch. When Julian finds out that Mary Beth had destroyed all his work, like he actually freaks out so hard he has a stroke. And it takes him a long time to recover, but he eventually does. And he finds out that his son, Cortland, made a baby with a Mayfair cousin. Like there's two sides of the Mayfair family and they both feud with each other. And he made, and Cortland made a baby with the other side. And that baby, was Evelyn, you know, the woman we just met who also had a child with Julian, who was fathered by Julian's son. It gets messy. Like this is no longer a family tree. It's just a few sticks on the ground. Like there's not enough branches, frankly. But anyway, Evelyn, she is a 13 year old girl and her family had been keeping her locked in the attic because she was a powerful witch and she could see premonitions of the future. And they were worried like the other side of the family would hurt her or something. And Julian loses his shit. He's like, hell no, she's getting kept in the attic. So he gets in his car and he goes over to that house to rescue Evelyn. And he uses Lasher because Lasher and him, they have a very fraught relationship, but like Lasher's down to fuck some people up. So <laughs> he calls down Lasher to get the family out of the way, intimidate them. And Lasher does. And Julian just marches right into their house and he goes and rescues Evelyn. And Evelyn gives him the prophecy for the future she had, which gives Julian hope that the family will finally be able to defeat Lasher someday. And, you know, Julian believes Michael's the one who's going to fulfill this prophecy prophecy. And we, we already know Julian and Evelyn start to have a sexual relationship. She is 13 years old. Holy shit. And through the child that she has with Julian, we eventually get to Mona Mayfair. So this is, you know, Mona's family branch. And, and Julian dies not too long after the child's born, but he had built this failsafe for himself with his gramophone. Like he was adding bits of his hair, his fingernails, and his blood all into the wood so that when it's played, it could help summon him in, as a ghost and he'd be able to communicate with the family again, which takes us up to now. So we're gonna put a pin in Michael's storyline for a hot second. 
what's been going on with Rowan this whole time? We really haven't heard from her that much. So in the end of the last book, she ran off with Lasher, kind of in like a motherly instinct to protect her young type of situation. And she starts to realize almost immediately she is way over her head. Lasher has been very physically violent to Rowan and sexually violent to Rowan and she's getting sicker by the day. So she tries her best to like study Lasher scientifically and she basically needs more advanced research and technology than she has access to and she manages to, you know, sneak around Lasher and send the samples back to Larkin and Mitch so they could like research them better. But basically the whole time Rowan is off with Lasher, she's being beaten and assaulted multiple times and still is somehow craving to be with Lasher even though with every fiber of her being she is disgusted by him and loathes him. It's a horrible sexual terror situation she's in. Eventually though she does convince Lasher to move back to the United States because they were running around Europe and she's like listen they're gonna figure out we're in Europe they're gonna find us why don't we go back to the United States. It, they won't find us there. So they, they fly back to the US and they actually move into a building in Houston, which actually isn't all that far from New Orleans. It's like right in their own backyard. So they move there, but Rowan's imprisonment still continues. Lasher like impregnates her multiple times until one sticks. And he also ties her up and leaves her for days on end. And you know, while Rowan is imprisoned, Lasher's going off and trying to impregnate Mayfair women. And he gets at least six of them, like a lot, including even uh, Mona's mother, Alicia. Like he, he gets all of them. All of the women die of a uterine hemorrhage like within a day of each other. So he's not even taking a break. And all while that's going on, the Talamasca are sending like agents to these genetic laboratories that had samples and like pretending to be Larkin and then collecting all the samples with the genetic research. And in Mitch Flanagan ends up dead, the real Larkin disappears. Like the Talamasca is doing some crazy spy shit right now. But one day towards the end of Rowan's pregnancy, she manages to get the jump on Lasher. And she beats the heck out of him with the, like the toilet tank lid and he's down. So she makes a run for it while she can. Mind you, she's also super pregnant with, with a Lasher baby named Emilef, that's her name. And she can now telepathically communicate with her fetus. So she makes it out of the building. She flags down a truck and, and she just throws a wad of money at the guy. And she's like, take me to New Orleans, I need to go. Luckily the guy in the truck is like, oh shit, like, I, are you okay? Like he's actually trying to help her. So he's like, get in, I'm going that direction. And they manage to get into Louisiana before the pain gets just too much for Rowan and she starts going into labor. So she, she gets the truck to pull over and she like runs out of the truck and she goes and finds this clearing. The birth scene is like alien level body horror. <laughs> like Emileth literally crawls out of Rowan and then starts growing rapidly. And she starts nursing from Rowan and then just grows into a full grown woman baby like Lasher did. And Rowan is dying and begs Emileth to go to Michael in New Orleans and stay away from Lasher, she begs her. And then she passes out because she's, you know, having a uterine hemorrhage. MLF gets cleaned up. There's like a little pond. She, you know, she has all the afterbirth still on her. She gets cleaned up and she starts her journey. And she comes to like the nearest house, I guess, to this clearing and it's this older couple. And they help her because, you know, she's a newborn woman baby and completely naked. So she, they're all like, what is wrong with you? So they give her some clothes and she tells them that her mother's back out in the field and not quite dead yet. So the husband's like, oh, okay. And he like goes out in the field to go look for this mother, you know. And once MLF, um, you know, she gets dressed, she has like glass of milk. They really like milk. Uh, she just sets off to New Orleans. She's like, all right, okay, bye, thanks. And... Luckily though, she did stop by and like say something because Rowan is found. The husband went out and looked for her and also the truck driver like called the cops and he was like, this lady, I don't know what happened to her. She's like pregnant and shit. So a lot of people like told authorities that this woman 
something wrong is happening. So when they find Rowan, they bring her to the hospital and it saves her life, kind of. Like she basically went into toxic shock and she had an emergency hysterectomy and her brain was damaged to the point where she's now like in a permanent vegetative state. So she's technically alive, but not really. And that takes us to the point where Michael's conversation ends with Julian. So, you know, he comes out of his Julian trance. Michael finds out they found Rowan. He runs off directly to go be with her night and day. Meanwhile, the whole rest of the Mayfair family is gathering together for protection. They even hire armored guards to protect all of the women in the family from Lasher. No female Mayfair is ever alone anymore. They're all gathered together for protection. And Yuri, you know, Aaron's protege, finally arrives in New Orleans around this time as well. And he's immediately intercepted by this other Talamasca agent called Stolov. And everyone's being real weird about the, the whole situation. And like, Yuri smells a rat here. He's like, mm, this is, something's not right. You know what, pull over. I'm gonna stop and get some protection. And so he goes and he like buys like a 38 special. So um, yeah, he's, he's gearing up for a fight. So Stolov and Yuri go to see Aaron and Stolov is trying to convince both of them to go back to London and get away from the Mayfairs and just let the rest of the Talamasca handle the situation. But Aaron also like smells a rat here. So, and he kind of just politely tells Stolov to fuck all of the way off. <laughs> so Yuri and Aaron, they stay with the Mayfairs and in doing that, they are excommunicated from the Talamasca. And I guess kind of to celebrate his freedom, uh, Aaron and B go get married. Yeah, Aaron, you get some, Aaron. Like, Aaron and B get married. I love that. We needed one moment of non-sexual terror in this book, and they gave it to us. And since this whole crisis started with all the deaths and disappearances, Mona's really stepped up, and she's such a powerful little witch and kind of is... I don't know, she comes across as very adult in a child body that everyone just starts letting Mona lead the family. And she's, she's 13. Like, she's still a kid. <laughs> like, but they all are just kind of cool with Mona taking charge of shit. And Mona finds out that the family's making plans for if Rowan dies, who's going to be the new inheritor? Guess what? Mona's in line. So Mona's like, oh shit. I don't want to be the inheritor. I'm 13. She finally has a freak out about it. And also, you know, she wants Rowan to live. She uh, she kind of feels bad about banging Michael and stuff. So she's like, well, I, the least I could do is try to help her live. So she ends up like getting a bunch of other Mayfairs who have other healing type abilities to try to heal Rowan, but none of them are successful. So at least she's trying. And then things just keep going on like that. Like Rowan's getting the best medical care that money can buy. Um, Aaron advises the family to cut off all ties with the Talamasca because they're up to some shit and just stay together for protection because they haven't found Lasher yet. It just kind of goes on like that. Then one day, there's a knock at the door and Michael answers it and it's Stolov. How did he get past the damn security guards? They suck, they're stupid, they don't do nothing. They should all be fired, they, they're securing nothing. <laughs> and you know what, guess who else also shows up at the house? Lasher, fucking Lasher is now at the Mayfair house. He's dressed up as a priest and he's crying like he always does. Seriously, all this guy does is cry and assault people. And so Stolov and this other agent, Norgan, they stop Michael from killing Lasher on the spot because they want to take Lasher back with them into their custody. But first, before the, he gives himself to the Talamasca, Lasher wants to sit down with everybody, especially Michael, and like tell his life story. So now we go to flashback number two and we get Lasher's life story told by Lasher. So Lasher is actually another species called a Taltos. And a Taltos like is actually a real thing in like pagan mythology. And it, it essentially is a human born with something extra, like an extra finger or something like that. And it, and it gives them special abilities like healing or mind reading, etc. And in Anne Rice's world in particular, they're also born fully formed adults and like reproduce real quick. And so, you know, all this kind of checks with Lasher being a Taltos. So Lasher is born a full grown man baby. And guess who his parents were? Well, it was the Earl of Donleith, 
And Anne Boleyn. Yeah, the Anne Boleyn. The Earl, he takes Lasher with him back to Donleith shortly after his birth. And like Donleith is super Catholic still. And the Earl proclaims his son to be the reincarnation of Saint Ashler, who was also a Taltos. So this is kind of received with mixed results. Some people are cool with this. Some people want to burn him with fire. Mixed bag. So what the Earl does is send Lasher off to Italy to learn to be a priest, and then when the time is right, he'll come back to Donleith and lead the church there. So Lasher goes to Italy, and he does pretty well there. He's learning to be a priest. Um, he cares a lot for like the sick, and the ones that he cares for tend to make full recoveries, you know, a Taltos thing. And the people start noticing this in particular, and they start leaving him offerings of milk because like all he ever really wants to do is drink milk. Like Taltos are real in the milk. Like it's uncomfortable how much he likes milk. And all throughout his life, Lasher is constantly questioning, is he a priest and a, and a servant of God or is he actually a monster? He doesn't really understand his own nature and he can never really be certain which one he is more than the other. So he decides the only way to really test out his humanity is to have sex with a woman. Mind you, up until this point, he's about like 20 years old, um, he had been completely celibate. And then one day, this woman, she kind of like takes Lasher back to her house and she lives there with three other women and they're all sex workers. And Lasher goes from no sex to having all of the sex with all four women repeatedly. So after the bang fest, Lasher's real tired. He takes a nap and then when he wakes up, he's surrounded by four dead bodies, all having died from a uterine hemorrhage. So he is horrified and he's like, oh no. He runs back to the church, he goes to confession and the other priest just tells him, no, 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 don't worry. You know what? You made a mistake. Priests make mistakes sometimes, but it's okay. You couldn't have killed, killed these women. Like obviously there was a plague and God saved you from it. Like you're a good guy, Lasher. Since this other priest told him this, Lasher has to go along with it. He's like, okay, I guess that makes a lot of sense. But in the back of his mind, he's still really freaked out by it. And it doesn't help any that he's also being followed by the Talamasca. So this agent, he approaches him one day and he tells him he knows the truth about what he really is. And Lasher should come back with him to Amsterdam so they can talk more. And Lasher is like, no, this is stranger danger. This guy is obviously in league with the devil. I am not dealing with this at all and he bolts. He goes back to the church and he goes to the head priest and he, he just starts talking, confesses his whole life story, you know, being born a full grown man baby till now. And he, he expects like the, the priest to be like, this is a crazy story, what are you doing? But that doesn't happen. The head priest like believes him because a Scotsman who was actually Lasher's half brother had just come to the monastery to pick him up. Don Leith finally wants Lasher back after like 20 years. So Lasher decides to go back with his brother to Don Leith and they arrive on Christmas Eve, <laughs> you know, a magical time of the year. And Lasher's father wants him to hold Christmas mass in the cathedral as like a way of sticking it to all the Protestants who've been threatening to burn it down. And, and Lasher also meets his half-sister, Emma Leth, who he is now named his baby after. And she smells amazing to him, which is a sign that she might be genetically compatible enough to mate with him. Yikes. But Emma is not about to fuck her brother. She's like, no, 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 no. She tells Lasher, you are not a reincarnated saint. You're a Taltos and you need to get the hell out of Scotland before you bring doom to us all. But Lasher doesn't want to listen to that. He decides he's going to go forward with Christmas Mass instead. So Lasher, he goes to start praying before Mass and his sister comes and she gets him and she brings him to this other room where the man from the Talamasca is. He followed him all the way from Italy and he proceeds to tell Lasher what a Taltos actually is. So basically they were like a species that lived on this island near Scotland and then when the Romans invaded, they tried to breed with them so, you know, they could make a whole race of full-grown man-baby soldiers, but it never really worked. So the Romans just decided to exterminate them all instead, and a few managed to survive. And, you know, they repopulated, and later on, Christianity comes to Scotland, and a Taltos named Ashler, 
hears about, you know, the gospel. And Ashler ends up turning against his own people, and he decrees that all Talthos should be killed because they don't have souls. But actually, it was really to stop the species from overrunning the world since they can reproduce at an unheard of rate. So after all of the Taltos were exterminated, he became Saint Ashler. Emileth begs Lasher to go with the Talamasca because the town is going to use him as a sacrifice. You need to get the hell out of here. The Talamasca want Lasher to come with them because they know where a female Taltos is and they want to try to breed them. You know, like hamsters. Like they just were trying to breed Taltos. But Lasher, he still turns him down. He's like, nope, I'm going to give Christmas mass. I'm really set on this path. Now, I've been, I've been telling you about Lasher's story for a minute. I'm just going to tell you right now, shit's about to get wild, okay? Like, just buckle up. So after mass, the whole town goes back to the castle for, like, a big feast. And they start playing this very specific rhythmic music that ensnares Taltos. Much like, you know, in the later days in the Mayfair family, they found this music that confuses Lasher. So Lasher is kind of, like, in this musical trance a little bit. And they bring in this really deformed female Taltos. And I guess like the mating instinct is just real strong because oh boy, does she run at Lasher like vagina first. And like, they just start like mating like animals right on the dining room table, just immediately. And like right after they finish, within minutes, like a brand new Taltos is born right away fully formed. And the townspeople, they keep playing this rhythmic music over and over again, making each new Taltos like mate with each other until they have a whole bunch of them. No gestation period here. They're just popping out like fucking gremlins. So when they finally have enough of them, they like drag Lasher and all the other Taltos through the cathedral as it burns down. And, and they take all the Taltos through this like ritual circle in the valley and they like stone and burn them to death as a sacrifice for like the town's prosperity. And then the next thing Lasher knows is Suzanne calling to his spirit to come and be her avenger. That's the next memory he has. And that kind of takes us to now. After Lasher finishes his story, all the men at the table are a little taken aback <laughs> because, you know, they were popping out like gremlins. And so the Talamasca, they want to take Lasher back with them still, presumably for breeding purposes, I guess. And Aaron somehow supports this decision. Like, two, Aaron, you're gonna betray us like this? Not cool. But, but Michael is having none of this bullshit. He's like, Lasher, I don't care how shitty your childhood was. You have murdered several women. You murdered my unborn son and destroyed my wife. I am going to fucking end you. And if you thought shit was wild before, it's about to get even wilder, okay? So Lasher, he fucking runs. He's like, uh-oh, Michael means business. And Stolov and, and Norgan, they're trying to stop Michael. But Michael, he like knocks out Norgan and then he pushes Stolov down the stairs, killing him. And he chases after Lasher. The Lasher, he gets up into the third story room and he like locks himself in. And Michael just psh, like kicks the door down and, he, and they start fighting. It's just like a boxing match. And like shit gets brutal. Like Lasher honestly is starting to win. He's stronger physically than Michael. But Julian's ghost appears and like kind of points out a hammer to Michael and Michael takes this advice and he grabs a hammer and he hits Lasher in the head with it like really hard and, and Norgan like had woken back up and he runs in and Michael whah, hits him in the head with a hammer kills him too and after Norgan's down Michael just keeps wailing on Lasher with a hammer but like Lasher still isn't quite dead he's just kind of stumbling around and Lasher starts seeing Antha's ghost out on the balcony, you know, where she fell. And um, so he goes out on the balcony and Michael shoves him off the balcony and he just splats on the concrete. And Michael, he climbs down like the trellis and he goes over to Lasher and he just proceeds to keep beating his head in with a hammer until there's nothing more than like pulp and teeth. So after that's all done, Michael, he goes and he buries Lasher under Deidre's oak tree in the backyard. But, you know, he still has to go deal with those other two dead bodies of Stolov and Norgan. So, you know, he finishes up with Lasher. He's like, oh, I'm going to be sore in the morning. And he goes back into the house to, you know, deal with the other two bodies. 
But turns out Yuri and Mona had arrived a little bit ago and they already disposed of the bodies for him. So, you know, that's a freebie. Michael just kind of didn't have to do anything with those bodies. He's getting away with it. So Mona, she takes Michael to his room. She helps him like change out of all of his bloody ass clothes and she like burns them. And Michael gives her the Mayfair pendant that Lasher actually had on around his neck. He pulled it off whilst burying him. And the next day, Aaron and Michael, they kind of make up with each other. Um, they talk about the Talamasca and like whether or not like it actually was created with for the purpose of breeding Taltos. And like, it kind of makes sense, honestly. Like at least the early Talamasca's main objective was saving witches from persecution. And the thing is, there are some witches who are capable of breeding with Taltos. So maybe these two things are related. But Aaron basically decides, you know what? Fuck it, not my problem. I'm already out of the Telemasca. Like I'm not gonna deal with that shit. So Yuri, he ends up going back to London to like investigate the Telemasca elders and see what's going on with this. And also side note here, apparently Yuri and Mona kind of have a thing now. Mind you, Yuri is 30 years old and Mona is still 13 fucking years old. Dear Lord, why? So Michael, he goes back to Rowan's room just to like watch over her and he looks out the window and he sees this tall girl with reddish hair. It's fucking MLF. She finally showed up. And throughout the story, we had checked in on her every once in a while. And basically she kept getting distracted on her trip to New Orleans with like dancing and music and, and sex with humans. So, so that's really why it took her so long to get here. She just had a lot of like stops along the way. And, and Michael, he just starts talking to Rowan, even though, you know, she's unconscious and just telling her everything that's happened with Lasher and Mona and Julian. And then, you know what? He's like, I'm gonna go get Julian's gramophone and like play you La Traviata. You know, let's just finish up this story. So he leaves the room. And when he comes back, he finds Emma left in the room crying over Rowan and breastfeeding her. And the nutritious Taltos milk was exactly what Rowan needed to revive herself. But once Rowan like kind of comes back to consciousness and realizes she's breastfeeding, she freaks the hell out. And she's like screaming at Michael to kill Emma Lev. She's like, kill her, kill her. And Michael's like, what? No, what is happening right now? And, and Rowan just decides I'm gonna take care of this myself. And she grabs Yuri's gun that was on the nightstand this whole time, you know, for protection. And she shoots MLF in the face three times. Like MLF doesn't have a face anymore. And then on top of that, Rowan goes over to the body and proceeds to finish breastfeeding, just like really going to town on those boobs. So Rowan finally finishes breastfeeding and she starts crying because she realizes that she just killed her daughter who was kind of innocent in all of this. So she tells Michael, that she's going to bury her under the oak tree next to Lasher. And then that's the end of the book. Dear Lord, was this bonkers. Like, I, I don't have words. I don't have words for how insane this book was. It's wild that this exists. I, I'm just stunned it was published. It's insanity. The only way I can describe it is sexual terror. That's the genre it's in. And there's still one more book of this series. I don't know where they're going after this one. I, I, I don't know how they're gonna top the crazy factor, but like, it's gonna be wild when they do. Let me know in the comments down below, what was the wildest part about this book for you? Me personally, I think it's when they were popping out like gremlins. That's wild to me, that's insane. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you wanna see more videos, make sure you subscribe. Also, if you want cool exclusive content, including a book club and early access to videos, you can consider becoming a channel member or a patron. Links for that are in the description down below. And on that note, I will see you guys soon. Goodbye.